Hello, Omar. My name is Amy. May I examine you? Yes. On general inspection, note if the patient looks unwell, breathless, cyanosed, frightened or distressed, or has any scars. Please, could I see your hands? Signs you may see in the hands include tobacco staining, peripheral cyanosis, splinter hemorrhages, and finger clubbing. Finger clubbing is an important but non-specific sign. The cardinal features are loss of nail bed angle and increased fluctuation of the nail bed. Cardiovascular causes include cyanotic congenital heart disease and bacterial endocarditis. To examine the radial pulse, use the pads of your three central fingers over the right radial artery at the wrist as shown. Assess rate, rhythm and volume. Count the number of pulsations in 15 seconds and multiply this by 4 to get beats per minute. Do you have any pain in your shoulder? No. To detect a collapsing pulse, raise the patient's hand above their head. Palpate both radial pulses simultaneously, assessing any volume differences or delay. The brachial artery can be palpated medial to the biceps tendon using your thumb. Cup your fingers around the back of the elbow joint. Use your left hand for the left elbow and compare sides. The brachial and carotid pulses give accurate assessment of the character and volume. Cardiovascular assessment should always include measurement of blood pressure. Use an appropriately sized cuff. The center of the bladder should be positioned over the brachial artery. The arm should be comfortably supported at about heart level and free of tight clothing. The patient should be lying or seated and rested. Palpate the brachial pulse as you inflate the cuff. The point at which the pulse becomes impalpable is a rough estimate of the systolic pressure. Inflate the cuff by a further 30 millimeters of mercury and then listen over the brachial artery with the diaphragm of your stethoscope. With the cuff inflated above systolic pressure, you should not hear anything. Slowly reduce the cuff pressure by 2-3 to three millimeters of mercury per second. Note the point when you start to hear a tapping sound. This marks the systolic blood pressure. Continue to deflate the cuff. The point at which sounds are no longer heard marks the diastolic blood pressure. There are some more subtle features to the Korotkov sounds which are described in detail in the textbook. I'm just going to press gently on your neck. To feel the carotid pulse, press gently backwards with the thumb tip between the larynx and anterior border of sternocleidomastoid. It is a good idea to do this with the patient recumbent and only one side at a time. To look for the jugular venous pulsation, start with the patient lying supine at 45 degrees. Could I get you to turn your head very slightly to the left hand side? Make sure that the patient's head is resting comfortably so that the neck muscles are relaxed and look across the neck from the right hand side in good light. The JVP is the vertical height of the top of the pulsation above the sternal angle. Do you have any pain in your tummy? No. If uncertain, you can use hepatojugular reflux or occlusion to identify the JVP. I'm just going to have a look in your eyes. Look for xanthelasma, corneal arcus, and conjunctival pallor. Could you open your mouth for me? In the mouth, look for central tongue. cyanosis under the tongue and dental caries that can precede bacterial endocarditis. Inspect the precordium with the patient sitting at a 45 degree angle with the shoulders horizontal. Look for surgical scars, including a left thoracotomy, visible pulsations, and chest deformity. Lay your whole hand flat over the precordium to obtain a general impression of the cardiac impulse. Locate the apex beat by laying your fingers on the chest parallel to the rib spaces. Describe the most infralateral position where the pulse can be felt. This is normally in the fifth interspace at or medial to the midclavicular line. You should also note the character of the apex beat. Could you take a deep breath in? Breathe out and hold. Feel for right ventricular heave with the heel of your hand in the left parasternal position. Breathe normally. Feel for thrills with the pads of the fingers at the apex and the left and right sternal edges. 
a thrill is a palpable vibration. If you subsequently hear a murmur on auscultation, you should go back and feel for a thrill in order to grade it. The bell of the stethoscope emphasizes low-pitched sounds, such as the normal heart sounds. The diaphragm is better for higher-pitched sounds. At each site, identify the first and second heart sounds, assess their character and intensity, note any splitting of the second heart sound. Feel the carotid pulse with your thumb to time any murmur. Concentrate in turn on systole and diastole. Listen for added sounds and then for murmurs. Soft diastolic murmurs are sometimes described as an absence of silence. Listen to the precordium systematically with the bell and the diaphragm. Listen at the apex where you felt the apex beat. This is a good sight to hear mitral murmurs. The lower left sternal border is the best place to hear the murmur of a VSD, among other things. The upper left sternal border is the best place to hear pulmonary valve murmurs. And the upper right sternal border is a good place to hear the murmur of aortic stenosis. Please take a breath in and hold. Listen over the carotids with the diaphragm in held inspiration. Take a deep breath in. You may hear the radiation of aortic stenosis murmur or carotid bruise. Listen in the left axilla with the diaphragm. The pan-systolic murmur of mitral regurgitation, often described as loud and blowing, can radiate here. Next, we listen specifically for mitral stenosis with the bell at the apex. Please could you roll onto your left-hand side. Accentuated in the left lateral position. This is a mid-diastolic rumbling sound, which may follow an opening snap. Please could you sit forward for me. With the patient leaning forward, Take listen in held expiration. And out. And hold. For the murmur of aortic regurgitation, best heard at the left sternal edge in the third or fourth Breathe intercostal normal. space. Listen over both lung bases posteriorly with the bell. Breathe in. And out. For the symmetrical medium crackles and of in. pulmonary edema. And out. Examine for superficial edema over the sacrum, a common location when patients are bedbound. Using two finger pads, press gently for a few seconds and see if this leaves an indentation. Please lie yourself flat. We continue now with examination of the peripheral vascular system in the abdomen and legs. Begin by inspecting the abdomen, looking for any obvious pulsation or surgical scars. Palpate over the abdominal aorta. Remember this is above the umbilicus. If the aorta is easily palpable, consider the possibility of an aneurysm. If in any doubt, organize an ultrasound scan. A pulsatile mass below the umbilicus may be due to an iliac aneurysm. Listen over the aorta for a brui associated with atheromatous disease. Also listen for a brui in the renal arteries bilaterally. You should also listen to the loins posteriorly. Renal artery stenosis is an important cause of hypertension. Renal artery bruies cannot be distinguished from those in adjacent vessels, such as the mesenteric arteries. Inspect the legs and feet for changes of ischemia, including colour change and loss of hair. Note scars from any previous surgery, and feel for temperature differences in the feet. Pay particular attention to the position, margin, depth and colour of any ulceration. Look specifically in between the toes for any ischemic changes. Also take care to inspect the balls of the feet, the heels and their posterior aspects, which are a pressure area in bedbound patients. Feel for temperature differences using the backs of your hands. Feel the lower limb pulses, starting with the femoral pulse. Warn the patient what you're going to do. You'll find the femoral pulse just below the inguinal ligament, and about halfway between the anterior superior iliac spine 
and the pubic tubercle. Use the pads of your extended index and middle fingers. This pulse can be difficult to feel in obese patients. Remember that the common femoral artery is now a frequent point of vascular access for percutaneous intervention. Simultaneously palpate the right femoral and right radial pulses to check for radiofemoral delay, which can be a sign of aortic coarctation. Use the diaphragm of your stethoscope to listen for femoral artery bruies. A bruy is a rushing sound made by turbulent flow. In the context of arterial disease, this is due to narrowing and irregularity of the vessel lumen. Remember that if a vessel is completely occluded, there will not be a bruy. Next, assess the patient's popliteal pulses. The patient must be on a firm, comfortable surface and have relaxed muscles. Bend the knee to 30 degrees and with your thumbs in front of the knee and fingers behind, press firmly in the midline over the popliteal artery. It is sometimes difficult to feel and you may need to readjust your position. If the popliteal artery is especially easy to feel, consider the possibility of an aneurysm. Feel the posterior tibial pulse, 2 cm behind and 2 cm below the medial malleolus of the ankle. Palpate with the pads of the index, middle and ring fingers. We also assess the foot pulses with a Doppler probe when measuring the ankle brachial pressure index. With the same fingers, feel midway down the dorsum of the foot, just lateral to the tendon of the extensor hallucis longus for the dorsalis pedis pulse. I'm going to lift your leg. Finally, we perform Berger's test. With the patient lying supine, you raise the patient's foot or feet and support the legs at 45 degrees to the horizontal. This position is kept for two to three minutes. Look for pallor on elevation with emptying or guttering of the superficial veins. Can I get you to sit up and to swing your legs over the bed? Watch the patient's feet for a further two or three minutes. The combination of pallor on elevation followed by reactive hyperemia or rubor on dependency is a positive result implying significant peripheral arterial disease. 